Hello everyone and welcome to Online Church. We are very excited that you've tuned in to join us today. Um, I just wanted to quickly speak on this first song that we're going to sing together. Um, a couple of months ago, I was at Life Group and out of nowhere, we're in discussion and I just broke down in Life Group and it was, yeah, completely unexpected and my Life Group prayed for me and it's because I was really, really struggling with my faith and my Life Group came around me and they prayed for me and when they were praying for me, I had these lyrics in my head and it said awake my soul and sing sing his praise aloud sing his praise aloud and it kept playing in my head and this was a while ago and I didn't know this song very well I knew of it but not very well of it um and when Jared introduced this a few weeks ago I was just like this is awesome because I for one have in this time really struggled with my faith in this moment of uncertainty and this song has just ignited my spirit and it's ignited my fire and my passion for God. And I know that in this time when we have no certainty of what's going on about so many things, I am so certain of my praise and my love for Jesus. So when we sing this together, let's, if you can, stand up, even if you're on your own, if you're in your, your huddles, whatever it may be, let's stand together and let's really sing over and praise our beautiful God. Let's sing. You're slumbering, it's time to 
when the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply fall, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your Thank you for the time you've given us today to meet together and to worship you um, in, our, in our watch parties, Lord. We pray that your spirit is moving and that you would move on to us, Lord, even this time where we're separated, that you would be working a, a, an amazing thing in our spirit, Lord, and that you'd be renewing us and bringing us forward towards you, Lord. Amen. Good afternoon. Welcome to church. We're so glad that you can make it today. My name is Emma. And I'm Jordan, and we're going to be your hosts this afternoon. If you are new today, we would love to know who you are and connect you in with church. If you are joining us online, there is a link below which will take you straight to our digital connect cards, or you can find them on our website. Another way that you connect, can connect in with our church is that you can join a life group. And there's no reason not to. We've got life groups all the way from Hillbank all the way down to Sturt. We've got, we're, they're everywhere. And if you can't come in person for any reason, then we're still running on Zoom in with the, the in life connect groups. Something that is common with both me and Jordan is that we are both interns. And our mid year intake for internship is coming up really soon. In August. August, wow, it's very close. Um, internship is a year. A long program, which is fun-filled, faith-filled. We um, set aside a day a week where we get to learn and grow 
um, in our relationship with God. We are led by our amazing pastors, Mike and Jenny. Yes, they are. Yes, they are amazing. Um, I have grown so much in internship. I wouldn't be up here on stage if it wasn't for internship. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Great work. Thank you. <laughs> I've uh, learned to trust God, and I um, lean into His presence. And if this sounds something um, that would be interesting to you, please get in contact with our pastors. Well, so we're going to transition to something that's really, um, really been placed on my heart through internship is that uh, giving back to the church and giving money to the church. I know, don't turn, it, don't turn off your computer. It's something that we need to talk about, and it's amazing. If you just give whatever you can to the church, it means that we can continue on with our amazing ministry and encounter. It's something that, it doesn't seem like a massive thing, but it really does um, amazing works. Um, and to give to the church, um, we've got, I think it's below us, We've got three different ways that you can give to us, or or, um, you can give in person to our pastors if you know where they live. (laughs) I'm gonna I'm gonna lead us in a prayer now um, before we move into Mike's message. Um, Please bow your heads, close your eyes, and join with me in prayer. Dear Lord, we just praise you for the uh, the moment we're in, where we can meet together now, where we can meet in watch parties, and so into each other's lives in person now, Lord. We just pray over the giving, that it would be handled faithfully, that the people who are giving would be uh, to be led to give through what they can, and the elders and the pastors would spend it wisely, Lord. Uh, we pray for Mike as he uh, comes up, Lord, um, that he would just be preaching a message straight from you, and that you would open our hearts to your message through him, Lord. Amen. Tonight's first teaching text is Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 22. Then Peter approached him and asked, Lord, how many times must I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? As many as seven times? I tell you, not as many as seven, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Our second reading is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 to 15. For if you forgive others their offences, your heavenly Father will forgive you as well. But if you don't forgive others, your Father will not forgive your offences. This is the Word of God. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, team. Great job, everyone. Just awesome, awesome stuff. A big hello, everybody. My name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here at Encounter Church. And like the team said, if this is your first time watching, just a huge hello. We'd love to know where you're from. If you're watching on YouTube or on Church Online or on Facebook, just jump down in the comment section. Let us know where you're from. We just love to know who's a part of what's going on. If you're at a watch party right now, because we don't do church alone, now that, you know, legally, we can not do church alone, uh, we want to encourage you, just send us a snapshot on the Instagram, just let us know what's going on, and um, we'd love to hear from you in that way. I'm going to get into the message in just a moment, Uh, and we're in the middle of a series on the Lord's Prayer, and the Lord's Prayer is this beautiful gift that Jesus gave us. It is a, a prayer that He gave us to teach us what it means to follow Him, what it means to be deeply connected with God the Father. And our aim during this series, church, is to equip you with a prayer that's directly from Jesus and directly for you to continue to build us as a church who contends in prayer, who hear from God in their everyday lives. And so as we, we pray our way into a better kingdom, as we do this, we are going through this habit where as a church, we are going to stand up and say the Lord's Prayer together. We're doing this all in unity right now. We've got the team here live with us. They're going to do it as well. And so the words are going to be on your screen. The team, they need to know it off by heart now. This is part of, this is why we do it every week. So, so let's repeat with me the words on your screen. We can start after three. Ready? One, two, three. Our Father in heaven hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. All right. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I love that. You can't see it, but they all came behind the camera like a little choir. It was adorable or terrifying, depending how you look at it. Look, I, I just need to ask your grace tonight, church. I've got to cover a lot of ground really quickly. And so if you're taking notes, I want to just ask, keep up and ask questions. Keep up and ask questions. Chuck them in the comments section as we're doing church online. Do whatever you need to do to stay engaged, because what we're talking about tonight is very, very important. We're in the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer, and this is, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, one little line, but so much packed into this, so much. This prayer is a challenge of forgiveness for us. So, when I was about 21, uh, which was like last year or so, I, God took me deeper into my faith and deeper into my discipleship journey, and in what I would describe as my second conversion. So it's not that I suddenly started believing in God. I was already believing in Jesus, but this was different. From this point, my Christian faith stopped being like a thing I did on Sundays, and it started being the anchor for my entire life. And maybe some of you had had a moment like that, where you already believed in Jesus, but then it became the center of your life. And I started asking this serious question, God, how do you want me to live my life? How do you want me to live my life? And one of the first things I sensed God saying to me was that I needed to go to people and ask for forgiveness. Now, this is different from repentance. If you're familiar with repentance, it's the process where we turn away from sin and turn toward Jesus, right? That, and, and then we, you know, have our, have our life in Jesus. We get saved by grace, justified by faith, all the good stuff as we turn from sin towards Jesus. Asking for forgiveness is a little bit different. This wasn't about something sinful I was currently doing, something awful I was doing right now. This was about acknowledging the hurt of the past. So God convicted me to ask forgiveness from three different people. One was a friend who I'd been envious of, and one was a parent that I'd, I'd dishonored, and one was a girl who basically I just messed with her emotions. <laughs> and it, you know, No, it wasn't funny. It wasn't funny. No, that's right. There are girls in the room shaking their head right now. That's right. Now, let's be clear. This is... This was all pretty small fry stuff. Like, I hadn't robbed any banks. I hadn't done anyone a grievous injury. None of this stuff had been on purpose. In fact, none of the people I apologized to and asked for forgiveness from were, like, sitting and waiting for it. And two of them seemed vaguely confused about what exactly I was asking forgiveness for. But that actually wasn't the point. The point wasn't just about them and giving them closure. The point was actually about me and my emotions and releasing myself, because forgiveness is a balm to the soul, church. It is a two-way street of healing. Now, it's probably no huge shock to hear somebody in the church talking about forgiveness. We should talk about forgiveness. Christians are meant to forgive. Everyone knows that. But forgiveness is a spiritual principle, but it's more than that. It's a psychologically transforming action. More specifically, unforgiveness is transforming. Unforgiveness is transforming. So let me give you give me give me some examples. Unforgiveness has been proven to have an effect on inflammation of your body, of your skin tissue, and of different parts of your body. Having an unforgiving spirit actually inflames you physically. It alters cortisol and adrenaline levels, and of course, it drives anger. And even just by anticipating it, it drives anger. If you anticipate a sense of pain that you think you're going to be unforgiving about. It drives pain in you. And it has been causing chronic pain in people. Let me give you another example. Well, let me say that again first. The anger, anger that might be in you from a bitterness, from an unforgiving spirit, could be causing you right now chronic physical pain. That might be new pain, or it might be pain as a result of this. So, for example, let's say you're in a car accident. Someone rear-ends you and, you, and you get whiplash, right? And so you have, a, you have a sore back, a sore neck, you need to recover from that. But you are having trouble forgiving the driver who rear-ended you. If you cannot forgive them, studies have shown your recovery will be slower. Isn't that unbelievable? Forgiveness is actually affecting your physical health, church. That's the transformative power of unforgiveness. 
And so what so often happens is this. People hold other people responsible now for what happened in the past. Holding other people responsible right now for what's happened in the past. So this is, in essence, the forgiveness trap. Do we forgive or do we not forgive? Do we move on from the past or do we be trapped in the past? The great theologian Will Smith put it this way, something might not be your fault, but it's still your responsibility. (laughs) But then he made Bad Boys 3, which is both his fault and his responsibility and him being trapped in the past. So, I don't know, maybe don't take Will's advice about it. Now, of course, it's nowhere as easy as just saying, move on from the past, is it? It's nowhere, no way it's just as easy as saying, don't be trapped, forgive and forget. That's too cute. That's too easy. That's cheap. After World War I, Germany had this problem big time. They would charge reparations in the peace treaty, the Treaty of Versailles, and they would charge the equivalent as a country of about $270 billion American. $270 billion as a nation. They'd just been through a war in which they lost. They had nothing. This was in 1919, and they didn't finish paying it off until, does anybody want to take a guess? 2010. 2010, they finished paying off the reparations from World War I. Entire generations were born, grew up, lived, and died in that time. And this was so damaging to their national psyche and the economy that it was in part responsible for the rise and election of Hitler and the Nazi party. And as such, World War II as well. So you can argue World War I is really responsible for World War II. The German people were stuck. They were trapped in this debt, literal debt, literal financial debt of the past until 1953. And let me tell you what happened. The London Debt Conference met, which sounds like a heck of a conference. And they forgave half of Germany's debt and extended their payment deadlines. And they gave the German economy, specifically the West German economy, a chance to recover and move on from the mistakes of the past. Now, this is a huge thing, a huge debt being forgiven, a huge mistake being acknowledged. But what do we see in this? Forgiveness is a two-way street. It involves the perpetrator and the victim and it is usually messy, complex, and humiliating. I just want to say that again. Humiliating, because it requires humility. When we ask for forgiveness, it requires our humility. So how do we understand Jesus' perspective on forgiveness? Because I gave you two really short teaching texts tonight, bracketed with that text in Matthew chapter 6 of the Lord's Prayer. And the first passage that we heard Emma read was from the very end of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus finishes his teaching, and he goes on to explain that if you forgive others their offenses, then your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, your heavenly Father will not forgive your offenses. This this is scripture. These are the words of Jesus. If you don't forgive others, God will not forgive you. How, How do we understand that? in light of being saved by grace. Because we can't just avoid it. It's right there. It's in the Word of God. We can't just get around that. And then just to reiterate the point, Jesus teases Peter in Matthew chapter 18 because Peter, sounding very much like one of my children, comes up and he's like, hey, Jesus, um, after I've forgiven someone seven times, on the eighth time, can I tell them to nick off? And, and Jesus is like, what, you, what, you think seven's like a magic number? No, it's more like 70 times seven, Peter. You know, and I definitely imagine Peter in one part of his mind is like, but on the 491st time, and Jesus is like, no, 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 you know, you're missing, you're missing the point. It's not a specific number. We're called to be people of forgiveness. And then Jesus goes on to tell a story of a man not forgiving others' debts in the same way that they themselves have been forgiven. He won't let us escape this idea. So we can't escape the scripture, but let me suggest something to you, church. Forgiving others is not a condition of your personal forgiveness. It's a reflection of it. Okay? Forgiving others is not a condition of your forgiveness, but a reflection of it. This might seem like semantics, but it's important. Let me explain. In these passages, Jesus is showing us that in order to accept the forgiveness of the Father, our hearts must be able to forgive others because it all comes from the same place. It's like breathing in and out. We can't accept forgiveness while holding unforgiveness to somebody else. Our lives don't work that way. 
We're not truly accepting forgiveness. Or maybe we are, but we're accepting what Dietrich Bonhoeffer used to call cheap grace. Cheap grace. A cheap sort of forgiveness where we get all the good vibes, but we forget the cost that Jesus paid. Giving and receiving forgiveness, church, they're linked. You can't get away from one with the other. To see full healing in a situation, we need both. When we forgive others, we show that we understand our own forgiveness from God. So I want to propose, buckle yourself in, seven different angles we need to think about tonight. Seven. With forgiveness that comes from the Lord Prayer. I know that seems like a lot, but it's also the number that Peter thought you could forgive people, so it seems like a good number. But it's also an important and a current need. We've got to catch this. This is so important to our current moment. So let me offer these to you. If you're taking notes, here we go. Buckle in. The first section is personal. Forgive me. Forgive me. It's about you, which is how we all like it in the West anyway. So this will appeal to everybody. So this first section, it's about you. Number one, God forgives you your debt. God forgives you your debt, your sins. God's forgiving you that. Let's start with the really obvious one. If you didn't know this already, let me tell you, God loves you. He has a plan and a purpose for you. And Jesus, God made flesh, has already come down to live the life that you should have lived and to take the death that you should have died and been resurrected and overcome the grave for you. Come on, hallelujah. It is good news, church. It is good news. And it may not seem like it if you're new, if you're unfamiliar with faith, but this is the most important part of forgiveness. The most important part of forgiveness is to accept God's forgiveness of us. The debt you owe God is cancelled. Your sins are forgiven you. And there's only one thing you need to do to claim that. Not to earn it, it's been done, but to claim it. It's like you're holding a lottery ticket here, and all you need to do is cash it in. You just need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Saviour. To put your faith in Him. It's a big thing, but take the little faith you have and put it in Jesus. And that's where this journey of forgiveness will start. And if you're somebody and you're here tonight, you're watching at home, you're like, Mike, I've always struggled with forgiveness, but I don't know about the Jesus thing. Give it a go. Start. Just take the little faith you have. Start praying. Just just have a conversation with God and see what happens. He's the one who saved you from that debt of sin. The one who bridged the gap between you and God. It's very simple. It's very deeply profound. But while that forgiveness saves you, there is much more work to be done to restore you. Much more work to be done there. So the second angle of forgiveness is this. You forgive other people's debts. You forgive other people's debts. Now, this is part two of forgiveness. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Now, why do we forgive other people? I mean, if they've hurt us, Shouldn't we make them earn it, eye for an eye, all that stuff? Okay, Look, can, we just, can we just put that aside and be a mature church? Okay. If you want to have that argument, you need to have it somewhere else. This is not the place for it. Jesus is not about that. When we forgive others, this is what happens. When we forgive others, we set them free from their past. When we forgive others, we release any pent-up bitterness and emotion and guilt from inside of us. But mostly, when we forgive others, we have an overflow of gratitude from what God the Father has done for us. That's why we start with the debt that God has forgiven before we forgive other people's debts. We, re- we work from a place of gratitude from that debt. Can I tell you, a lot of stats indicate this, that even more than 10 years after couples get divorced, half of them hold an intense anger against their ex. That's a really long time to be intensely angry. Can I let you know that? Like, if you've ever felt intensely angry, like, it's quite tiring. Can you imagine that for 10 years? The physical toll that would take on a human being. The bitterness that would rise up in people. But here's the worst bit. Stats show that children take this on. That children themselves begin to get angry. That it begins to rise up in them as well. Because bitterness overflows too. Unforgiveness overflows too. I want to be really clear. If you've been through pain like a divorce or somebody's hurt you, I'm not trying to diminish that. What I'm trying to do is encourage personal responsibility, moving on from that. 
as it's been said, unforgiveness, it's like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. Or in the words of Will Smith, it's taking responsibility for your past. It's an act of emotional self-defense. And yes, that's the second time I've quoted Will Smith tonight. Unironically, it won't happen again, probably. Let's move on to the third angle here. The third angle is this. Other people forgive your debts. So you've forgiven other people's debts. God's forgiven your debt. Now you, other people are forgiving your debts. This angle is kind of pretty obvious. You need forgiveness from other people. That's the journey God took me on that I was talking about before. But this is not as easy as it sounds. It is genuinely humiliating. It requires so much humility. In order to be genuinely forgiven, you need to ask for forgiveness. You can't just go, oh, I've avoided conflict with this person for a really long time, and it seems fine. I, I see you out there, passive-aggressive people, starting writing an email and trying to work out whether you should send it, complaining about it, this sermon. No, 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 no. You've got to acknowledge the hurt you caused. You've got to acknowledge the hurt you've caused. Now, I watch my kids say sorry a lot, and I can always tell when it's genuine. Frankly, it's not that hard. But I can always tell when it's genuine, and it's usually a combination of these two things. Number one, it's a genuine surprise and sorrow, and, and then it's the reaction in the pain they've caused in the other person. And those two things together, it, it's not just that they're saying sorry, which they do to each other, all the time because their parents make them. But it's, it's, this, it's this deep, instinctive, I am genuinely sorry. I'm so sorry that I have done this to you. The difference is so profound. If you've hurt somebody, you need to reconcile yourself to them. You need to own up to that hurt. In fact, Jesus talks about it, says, don't even come to the Lord's table to have the Lord's Supper, communion, unless you've reconciled yourself with your sister or your brother. But here's the thing, when you own up to that hurt, after that, it's up to the other person to decide if they're ready to forgive you. They may decide they're not, and you can't do anything about that. Or, but here's the thing, an apology is like an offering. You put it out there on the altar, and, and you just leave it, and you ask for forgiveness. It's part of your healing process. And this is important. It's very, very different. You going and asking for forgiveness is very, very different from passive-aggressively going to somebody and saying, I forgive you for what you did to me when you took my bus seat next to me. That was actually going to be my window seat, but I forgive you. And the other person's thinking, like, grow up, you know, move on, just move on. It's very, very different. You know know what I'm talking about. Like, I'm joking, but we do this passive-aggressive, like, I forgive you. And the other person's thinking, for what? But when we come asking for forgiveness. That's a whole nother ball game. That's a whole nother thing. Here's the fourth one in forgiving me. You forgive yourself. That's the fourth angle. You forgive yourself. And honestly, church, as your pastor, this is what I see the most among you guys. I see a real wrestle with people unwilling to forgive themselves. That's an unwillingness to let Jesus be Jesus. To let Jesus bear the burden of your sins, not you. As my old pastor used to say, get down off the cross, we can use the wood. He grew up in the country. I I don't know what you want. But the point is this. Jesus has already been sacrificed once and for all. When you beat yourself up about what you have done, I don't mean repenting. We need to repent when we sin. We need to turn away from that and turn to Jesus. But once we've done that, there is a tendency that instead of turning from the sin and turning to Jesus, we stare at the sin and beat ourselves up for still staring at the sin. And Jesus is like, I'm right here. I've done it all. I've done it all. Just let go. This breeds guilt. It breeds shame. It breeds condemnation and death. The worst part is, I know, church, that as I'm telling you this, it's landing with you and you're feeling guilt and shame about it. Don't feel guilt and shame. Feel conviction that this is something that I have been set free from. Why? Because Jesus forgave you. He forgave you. You have been set free. Learn the lessons from the past that you need to, but let it go. Let it go. Okay, part two, forgive us, forgive us. Frankly, any other week, I might have been tempted to bundle all of this all together and and try and get into three or four points just so, you know, you'd focus the whole time. I get it, it's tough. 
stand up and stretch if you need to, but this is where it's getting really, really important for the moment we live in. This is the week after global demonstrations for Black Lives Matter. This is a moment in history where we can't just talk about how sin and debt affect me. We need to talk about how our sin and debt affects us as a nation, as a world. So let's talk. This is the fifth angle where others forgive our sins. So not you forgive my sins, a group forgiving a group. That debt we talked about, Germany's debt, that's similar to that. Two weeks ago was National Sorry Day, and that's part of Reconciliation Week here in Australia. It's an attempt for those of us who aren't Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders to take some national responsibility for the atrocities of the past and move towards a better future that hasn't really happened for our First Peoples. We have dropped the ball. It hasn't happened, in fact, for many people of colour across the globe. Injustice and racism is the life experience of billions of people on this planet. And as a church, as followers of Jesus, that is not good enough. We are part of what Paul called the ministry of reconciliation. That means we have to build bridges and take responsibility for the sins of the past to clear away the rubble and build a bridge to a new future. So let me say this as a statement to our church, to our community. Black lives matter to this church. For Encounter Church, now and always, this will be a place where people of color can thrive and flourish. The bar is not, do they feel safe here? The bar is not, can you attend? The bar is, can you thrive? Can you flourish? Can you lead? Yes, now and always, you can thrive, flourish, lead, pray, worship, meet, marry, find friends, find faith, find hope in a future. Now and always, this church is a place for you. Always. Yes, all lives matter, in case that was something people were uncertain about. But not all lives are under threat of imminent injustice every day. So right now, black lives matter. And until black lives matter, the rest of our lives matter a bit less. If you don't matter, we don't matter. If all of us don't matter, none of us matters. That's kingdom of God stuff. We are all on the same page. So on behalf of myself, of my family, of our church, on behalf of Encounter Church, if you're watching and you're a person of colour, and particularly just from my heart, to people who are of Torres Strait Islander and Aboriginal background, we are so sorry. We are so deeply sorry for how we have let you down, for any explicitly or implicitly racist behaviour in anyone's past for how we have been tone deaf in our remarks and insensitive, for any time we've had a shameful, shameful refusal to act sooner and speak out louder, for our unwillingness to listen, to learn and to shift, we are deeply sorry. We're deeply sorry. And if you're somebody and this affects you and you want to reach out, you want to share your stories of racism, your stories of injustice with us, I would love to hear from you. We are here for that journey. We're here for the discomfort. We are here to be told hard truths. We are here to learn and grow together. Again, if all of us don't matter, then none of us matters. This is the beginning of our church apology. But it's going to keep going because we need to show that we mean this through our actions. We will keep going. That's my promise to you, church. We will keep trying. We will keep learning. We'll never stop listening. We will keep going on this journey. This is what it looks like for others to forgive our sin. This is one part of that, acknowledging the sins of the past. But then we come to the other side of it, where we forgive others, where a group forgives another group. Because it's one thing for us to come and do National Sorry Day and say we're sorry. It's another for the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islands, for the first peoples of our country who have had just injustice after injustice throughout their lives to go, yeah, that's cool. Because it isn't. See, this is the place we have to get to eventually, where forgiveness is earned, a place of mutual appreciation and understanding and harmony and peace. And this is beautiful, but you know what? It's Disney. 
isn't it? Like, it doesn't sound like real life. It sounds like a Disney movie. And honestly, how many of you find it hard to believe that we are actually genuinely going to get to a place where people of color are able to fully forgive those who have persecuted them, while the persecutors likewise also seek forgiveness? that you believe that systemic and personal racism will ever be truly eradicated. Like, really, how many of you believe that? Here's the problem with our view of the world and our view of forgiveness. We can't do it. We actually can't do it. We can't do this. Miroslav Volf says this. He's a Croatian theologian. He grew up under the persecution of the communist Yugoslavian government. He understands personal persecution. And he says this. The problem is that human beings can't absolve moral guilt. They can't absolve moral guilt. We can't. We can forgive, but we can't absolve. Absolution is a God issue. It's a God issue. And that brings us to the final angle. Fittingly, the seventh one. The seventh thing is this. God forgave our sin. Yes, God forgave your sin, but he also forgave our sin. Friends, the reason we can move towards an impossible-seeming future with confidence is because we ourselves don't do the final work. Jesus has not only forgiven you, he has broken the powers of sin and death. He has forgiven us. The world has been reconciled back to God in Christ, which means that the systems and processes of this world have too. We don't have to fear that the world will be broken forever because Jesus Christ has won the victory. The kingdom of God is breaking in. And you and I, do you know what our jobs are? Whether we're white or brown or black, whatever we are, our job is to be ambassadors for Christ. If we know Jesus, we get to be ambassadors for Christ in the ministry of reconciliation. What an honor. When you give your life to Jesus, if you've done this before, you get this tiny picture of heaven I don't mean that literally. I mean, it's, it is a tiny picture of heaven. That's why we do it, because we tap into something bigger than ourselves. We become aware of something beautiful and extraordinary and wonderful, that there is a God, and God has made a way. The great bridge builder has made a way for us to be reconciled with him, and then he turns and sets us to the task of being reconciled with one another through Christ, through what God has done. We see beyond ourselves just for a moment. So church, lift up your eyes. Jesus has won the victory. That doesn't mean there are no other battles. That's why our hearts are broken for what happened to George Floyd. That's why our hearts are broken for this injustice. But it does mean that God is bringing about a new creation. It does mean that the powers of sin have been defeated. It does mean that the next year can be the best year when the systems and processes and injustices of this world have been broken. Because frankly, it's not going to be worse. How could it possibly be worse than 2020? The next year will be the best year, church. We have the blessing to be at the front line of this ministry. So don't drop the ball. Don't cling to unforgiveness. Don't cling to your stubborn pride. Reach out. Ask for forgiveness. As we, as we come to a moment of prayer, what I want us to do is, is just take three minutes to pray with one another and just to confess to one another our sin. There's going to be a three-minute countdown clock on, on the screen in front of you so that you know exactly how long to pray and, and what to do. And what I want you to do is think about these four things. Just jump in twos and threes really quick right where you are at your watch party and ask yourself this. Where do you need to repent and receive Jesus' forgiveness? Where are you holding on to unforgiveness and bitterness? Where do you need to ask forgiveness from someone else? And where do you need to forgive yourself? And then the team's going to come back on and we're just going to finish with worship together. Three minutes right now. Take a moment in person, pray with somebody. Reach out, let the Spirit of God into your heart tonight. Why don't we pray together?
if you're not already standing, why don't we stand together? We're going to sing this last song together, Holy Spirit. And I just encourage you, if you feel comfortable, right where you are, if you just lift out your hands in front of you. And just surrender right now to Jesus and to His Holy Spirit. Let's sing. There is nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your our living hope. Your presence, Lord. And I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves. When my heart becomes free and my shame is undone, your presence, Lord. Let's sing, Holy Spirit.
unforgiveness, bitterness, race relations. It's, it's a lot. The moment we are living in is a lot to take in. Let me just read you something that might help from Colossians chapter 2. This is what it says, verses 13 to 15. You were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Jesus has defeated every spiritual authority. Jesus has defeated every racist and broken system. And you and I are set free both from those systems and to do something about it. So Lord Jesus, would you help us as we finish up tonight to be people of the resurrection, people who walk from Sundays into Mondays, letting the Spirit lead them on into. Father, would you help us be people of forgiveness, both to give and receive, and not in a cheap, easy way, but in a way in which we will wrestle with it. We will wrestle with it. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. You are welcome in our spirits. You are welcome to take over and lead us into and through this moment in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, friends, I hope you've had a great time at church. Why not have a chat with those around you? You may need some more prayer. Three minutes might not have been enough. Why don't you do that? Don't worry about it. Some of us will organize dinner. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Enjoy dinners together with your watch parties. Don't forget to do a watch party next week. Uh, We don't do church alone. Do it in a watch party. And you don't want to miss next week. Next week, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And preaching, my dear friend, the very muscular, very talented Dave Shepherd from Little Hampton Baptist, Hills Baptist, Little Hampton, but done. Hills is coming to preach and bring a cracker of a word. I cannot wait to have him with us. You don't want to miss that. Let your Sundays invade your Mondays. Go in the grace of God. We'll see you next week.